Hi, I'm Christine Benz from Morningstar.com. Investors love their dividends, but they should be sure to understand the pros and cons of various dividend strategies before buying a dividend-focused ETF. Joining me to discuss this topic is Alex Bryan. He's Director of Passive Strategies Research for Morningstar in North America. Alex, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Alex, let's start with a really basic question. Investors do like their dividends, but um, do dividend payers outperform non-dividend payers over time? Historically, they have, yes. If you uh, rank order stocks based on their dividend yield over the last 12 months, typically what you'll find is that there is a direct relationship between dividend yield and historic returns. So the highest yielding stocks have historically offered higher returns than their lower yielding counterparts, and those have in turn uh, offer better returns than non-dividend payers historically. Okay. You wrote a piece for Morningstar ETF Investor in which you kind of unpacked that performance edge. And when you looked at different factors, you found that the outperformance of dividend payers was actually correlated with the outperformance of certain factors that tend to be associated with dividend paying stocks. Let's talk about that research. Sure. So I think it's it's easy for people to focus on the dividends and not look at some of the other characteristics associated with the types of stocks that pay dividends. What I found was there was not a causal relationship between dividends and performance, but rather uh, dividends or high dividend yields tend to be associated with other characteristics that uh, help predict stock performance. So typically, your higher yielding stocks offer lower valuations. And regardless of the dividend payout policy, stocks that have traded at low valuations historically have outperformed stocks that have traded at higher valuations. That's the well-documented value effect. Right. Also, stocks that do tend to pay dividends usually have more stable cash flows than stocks that do not. And that, if you think about it, it kind of makes sense, right? Because the market tends to punish stocks that cut their dividends. So stocks, our managers are very reluctant to commit to dividends unless they think, or they have a high degree of confidence that they'll be able to honor those payments throughout the business cycle. Corporate managers. Corporate managers, mm -hmm. right. So. Uh, typically, the types of companies that do pay dividends do tend to have a bit more stable cash flows than your non-dividend payers. Uh, those companies are more defensive, and historically, more defensive stocks have offered better risk-adjusted performance over the long term. So it's a combination of lower valuations and then the more stable cash flows associated with those businesses that I think is the main driver of their attractive performance. Okay. One thing investors sometimes do, and they're in fact, ETFs set up to do this is kind of gun for the highest possible income, dividend income. But there are real risks associated with looking for high dividend paying stocks and f maybe focusing disproportionately on that high income stream. Let's talk about how those risks can crop up. So while I mentioned that uh, dividend paying stocks in general do tend to have more stable cash flows than non-dividend payers, uh, that's not necessarily the case with the highest yielding stocks. If you focus very narrowly on yield, you do run the risk of uh, owning a disproportionate share of companies that do have uh, relatively poor business prospects that are paying out a very high share of their earnings as dividends, and they may not have uh, as much of a cushion to buffer their dividends should their earnings fall. Uh, so there, there's a lot of examples throughout time of stocks that have offered very enticing yields, but uh, you know have subsequently been forced to cut their dividends and offered uh, terrible returns at the same time. So a good example that comes to mind, ConocoPhillips, uh, back in February 2016, in the wake of a collapse in oil and gas prices, uh, had to cut its dividend payments and has, has since offered pretty lackluster returns. Bank of America is another example from uh, the financial crisis that also offered a high dividend yield but was forced to, to then cut it. So I think it really is important to look beyond just yield. Um, now, funds that diversify this risk across many holdings can help you know, avoid these kind of one-off uh, firm-specific risk, but the risk is still there. Uh, a good example of this is the Oppenheimer Ultra Dividend Revenue ETF. This is an ETF that offers one of the highest dividend yields of any fund out there. It basically targets the 60 highest yielding stocks from the S&P 900 index. Um, and if you look at the back to performance of the index, because the fund hasn't been around that long, but if you look at how the indexes would have fared back in the financial crisis, it substantially underperformed the Russell 1000 value index because it tended to overweight some of these riskier names that face relatively poor business prospects. So I think it is important, like I mentioned, to look beyond just uh, dividend yield. Okay. I know you and the team look at the universe of dividend paying funds in, in really two groups. One are the yielders, which we're talking about here, as well as the, the growers. Let's talk about the that sub-segment of, of higher yielding ETFs. Is there one that you really like that you 
you think does this strategy right? Yeah, so I think uh, there's one of two ways you can go about um, dividend income in a way that will help mitigate some of these risks. One is uh, through broad diversification, you know, because I think the more broadly diversified you are, the lower the risk is that you may uh, have exposure to some of these, these distressed names. Uh, and, and the second piece is to have a, or, or second strategy is to have a dual focus on quality and, uh, and dividends. But uh, among the former stocks or uh, dividend strategies that are well diversified that help mitigate this risk, I really like the uh, Vanguard High Dividend Yield ETF. The ticker is VYM. This strategy basically targets stocks that represent the higher yielding half of all U.S. dividend payers, and then it weights its holdings based on market capitalization. What that does is it tends to skew the portfolio toward the most mature names in the market. These tend to have durable competitive advantages, uh, and it has a bit less exposure to the more distressed, highest yielding names in the market. I mean, it, it is owning the higher yielding half, but again, like the really risky names are still a relatively small part of the portfolio. So that's a strategy that um, is very well constructed. We give it a Morningstar an analyst rating of silver, and it charges a very low uh, eight basis points expense ratio. So it's one of the lowest cost dividend strategies on the market. So that's one that we really like. Okay. Let's take a look at the growers. These are dividend growth companies. Let's discuss kind of the thesis for that universe of companies. I know that um, investors have at various points in time gotten very enthusiastic about the dividend growers. But these aren't necessarily companies that have yields that are high in absolute terms or even a lot higher than the broad markets, right? Well, that, that's right. Uh, dividend growth is really more of a quality strategy than it is a an income strategy. If you look at a lot of these dividend growth strategies, their yields uh, aren't that much higher than the market. In some cases, they're not any higher than the market. So these are strategies that tend to look for stocks that have a consistent history of growing their dividends. Uh, and if you think about the types of companies that can do that, these tend to be very profitable companies that are less um, sensitive to the business cycle than most. Um, they tend to have durable competitive advantages that allow them to generate that consistency. So, uh, you know, there's a lot to be said for this strategy. It does tend to uh, lead you to more profitable names, and it's a bit more defensive than most yield-oriented dividend strategies. Okay. And then among ETFs that use that dividend growth strategies, are there any that stand out as, as being particularly good in this space? Yeah, actually, uh, Vanguard Dividend Appreciation is, is one of the better funds uh, in this segment. It, it also charges a very low expense ratio. But this particular fund uh, is looking for stocks that have a record of dividend growth uh, over the past 10 years. So it's looking for stocks that have raised their dividends in each of the past 10 years. Now, that screen in and of itself uh, doesn't necessarily capture everything you need to know. Uh, if you look at one of this fund's counterparts, it's a fund from PowerShares called the PowerShares Dividend Achievers ETF. That starts with that same dividend screen looking for dividend payers that have increased their dividends over the last 10 years. If you look at what that strategy had owned at the end of 2007, and actually owned Lehman Brothers, AIG, General Electric, all three of those companies weren't able to sustain that growth. So what the Vanguard- Needless to say, in the case, <laughs> in the case of Lehman, right? <laughs> That's right. Uh, but in the case of Vanguard, they, they recognize this and they apply some additional proprietary screens to try to weed out companies that are not likely to be able to, to sustain their dividend growth. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of transparency behind those, but if you look at the holdings, the differences between these two funds, which are similar, uh, the screens tend to weed out the highest yielding names from the portfolio, the most heavily indebted names, and some of the less profitable names. Um, now, the end result of that is that the Vanguard Fund is actually actually held up better during the financial crisis than the Parishers Fund. So there is a real advantage to applying these additional screens. Um, but it, it's, I mean, still going to own some stocks that may not be able to sustain their growth, but at least uh, these steps help mitigate that risk to a certain extent. Uh, it's a fund that we rate gold. We think very highly of it, and I think it's probably one of the best in the space. Okay, just some expectation setting. You said it's a quality strategy. There will be environments where it won't look particularly good relative to, say, the broad market. That's right. In fact, I, I would expect this type of strategy to do the best during market downturns. Uh, but perhaps lag during a stronger market environment. Okay, Alex, interesting topic. Thank you so much for being here to discuss it with us. Thank you for having me. Thanks for watching. I'm Christine Benz for Morningstar.com.